All right, uh, good morning, good evening to our global audience. Thanks again for joining us for our next in a series of webinars about expansion. Uh, I'd like to welcome Brian Grafton of FMD Architects again. Thanks, Brian, for being here. Welcome. All right, so today we're gonna talk about a kind of a delicate subject of uh, permitting and also uh, tenant improvements and working with landlords. The <clears throat> Originally, you know, most of the time we have brewers as headliners on these webinars, and uh, that's a real strength of the webinars. But I, I talked to a few folks, uh, some that are still currently in the middle of their expansions, and they were a little reticent to sort of uh, open up about uh, challenges they've had with permitting because they want to make sure their projects still finish uh, in a good fashion. And I think that's actually really wise. Uh, it's also a really exciting time to have this discussion because I can just count, you know, um, you know, about three or four breweries just in the last week that had major announcements. You know, Bear Lick Brewing in Portland, Oregon had their soft opening yesterday for the Barley Pod, a new beer hall and food cart area. Um, our members, new members in uh, the UK, Thameside Brewery, they're right in the middle of negotiations with their landlord. So there's, there's just a lot of exciting things going on right now. And Brian, thanks for making the time to, uh, to chat with us today and, and hopefully answer lots of, lots of questions. So sure. let's let's kick let's kick it off here, Brian. I think the 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 biggest challenge that I've seen, uh, you know, and this is really not just in the United States but overseas as well. It's a lot of uh, municipal governments get excited about breweries. They get excited about the opportunity of improving their community and bringing dollars in, but they don't really get how breweries work, and they and their their permitting processes and policies don't always fit with, uh, you know, the needs of, of a craft brewery. So can you talk a little bit about best practices or rules of thumb for educating the permitting agency on what it takes to, to build a brewery in their jurisdiction? Sure. Um, and of course, it's always gonna vary jurisdiction to jurisdiction, um, state to state. Um, you know, there's not a, a magic pill that I can give to solve all of those, but uh, some of the best practices just from doing multiple breweries and working with multiple agencies is always start with an early discussion. Um, there's nothing worse than buying a piece of property or leasing it, going down the line and finding out that you can't do anything with it. Um, you know, maybe the restrictions won't allow you to do anything or there's just other limitations or other mitigating factors that won't let you use it. So, um, one of the first things we do when we get involved with a project is we go and visit the uh, local jurisdictions or we'll give them a call and start talking about, you know, here's, here's what we intend to do with the space. Um, here's what kind of use groups and what kind of activities will be associated with it. Do you have any red flags? Are there any things that would make you want to hesitate that we want to make sure we focus in on when we put together plans? Um, so that's usually where we start just to get the conversation going. Um, the second benefit of that is that you can also explain a little bit more. Uh, I think the mill room's a notorious uh, red heron for a lot of these uh, agencies. They see, uh, oh, they're milling, this is a dust explosion, but you're not creating flour, and if you are, you need to maybe rethink how you're doing your brewing. Um, it's a, you know, basically, we will put notes on our drawings that say this is taken care of through practical means, it's cleaned. Um, same thing goes with ABV. They see, oh, you're producing alcohol. Do you need to explosion rate anything? Oh, your beers aren't often more than, you know, 12 to 14 percent on a, a good day and almost never more than 16 unless you're doing a specialty release. And, and even then, it's not vapors. So explaining all those things and just being earnest up front with them and making them feel like they're a part of the team, a part of the decision making is huge to letting them understand and buy in on your project rather than just becoming somebody you have to get over to complete your project. You know, that's really good advice. And, you know, I've even seen uh, breweries, uh, including crafting a strategy members, sort of band together to educate their agency. I've, uh, we've got a, a member at Camino Brewing in, in the San Francisco Bay Area down in San Jose. And even several years before they opened their, their tasting room, they started educating the San Jose city government on what it takes to open a brewery. In fact, Joe Belcher and I um, went down there for a meeting with the mayor, uh, Sam Licardo, and uh, there's a panel of about uh, five or six brewers. Um, our, our friend uh, Randall Barons from Live Oak Bank was down there. And, you know, at the time, 
just a regular building permit in the city of San Jose was $50,000. It was basically a non-starter for a craft brewery. And, you know, it's not necessarily the fault of that government. They were typically used to doing deals to let Google or, you know, um, uh, you know, Oracle come into town. And so that, that building permit wasn't a big deal, but it, by changing the 50,000 down to something more reasonable, the number of breweries in downtown San Jose is over five now, and it used to be two or three. So, um, you know, have you seen, uh, how receptive, I guess, are most of the agencies when you guys put these things in your drawings or just have a, an upfront and frank conversation early in the process? Are they pretty receptive? It's, uh, it's night and day. Uh, unfortunately, early on when we started doing breweries years ago, that's how we learned this lesson. Um, you know, initially said, well, this is the way it is. This is what you do. They're saying, well, no, code says it's this. So explaining early on and, and basically saying, well, here's, here's what's expected. Um, here's what we're proposing it has made a huge difference in smooth and streamlining that process. Um, and just keeping the dialogue going again is, is significant. Uh, you mentioned Texas, uh, I think earlier, we had a brewery project out there um, that wanted to have dogs on their patio. Well, the city that they're in had an ordinance to not allow it. And I explained, well, yeah, we, we do it all the time here. They can't come through the main door, but as long as they're allowed to basically come in through a fence and, you know, they're on a leash, it's usually not a big deal. You just have signs and, you know, supply a little bit of water and there you go. And they actually end up changing their entire ordinance just on a 15 minute conversation we had with them. Wasn't what we set out to do, but it works just by being upfront and honest with them, and just sharing what we've seen and experienced. That's a great story, Brian. I think it's it's important for me to mention that, you know, as as smart as Brian is, um, there's no way to anticipate all the jurisdictions and all the rules across, you know, every state and every county and and every city where you, you might be looking at your breweries. Certainly for our international clients, as well. But <clears throat> I think. Uh, it, it is, and, and if you do have specific questions, uh, you know, Brian is uh, more than happy to take emails. You can send an email to me, Sam at craftingandstrategy.com, and uh, I'll, I'll put you in touch with Brian or with Mark Moore at FMD, um, because I think uh, email is a really good medium for us to do this, because that gives, uh, Brian can probably answer you on the phone, but I need a little bit more time to make sure I sound good, so I like to do some research and other things. Uh, <laughs> Well, Brian, let's move on to another really important part of, of expansion and of permitting, and that is um, working with the landlords and, and tenant improvement allowances. You know, there, there's, I, I've had several uh, conversations with potential landlords who are excited about a brewery. You know, maybe they have a multi-use building with offices above and everybody gets excited about the chance to have, you know, a brew pub in there and, have, and give their, their other tenants more value. But, you know, gosh, once you, you know, cut drains in the floor and slope the floors, a lot of landlords don't necessarily understand that once a brewery is in there, the building, it's pretty tough to repurpose. So what, what, do, you, what do you have advice for our listeners about uh, working with landlords, maybe some rules of thumb on tenant improvements and allowances they should think of? Sure. Um, the big thing that we start off with as well is uh, you know, know where you plan to go or grow. Um, if you're looking at doing some significant tenant improvements to a space and uh, you're dumping thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars into it and you're not planning to stay there for more than five years, um, that's going to be a pretty tough rub for your bank and your financial lender to want to accept. Uh, you don't have the, um, you just don't have the property or the assets that they need to see to, you know, issue out that. So um, if you're not going to stay there long, you know, it's weird for an architect to say, but be careful what you put in because you may never see that money again. Um, second thing so, is basically, go ahead if you want to jump yeah, in. Yeah, um, on that, so the, the basic idea is if, if you're spending a lot of money and you can only get a five-year lease, what I hear you saying is your bank might have a problem with that because it's going to be tough for you to get, you know, the, the revenue that you need to pay that back. Um, you know, are, are you seeing uh, mostly 10-year leases or longer in, in these situations or is it like, like always kind of a moving target based on the amount of improvements that need to be made? It's been a moving target. Um, I've, got, I've got a few that I've worked with for five years, and we, we really narrowed down to just the critical areas that we needed to address. Um, ten years with first rider refusal for the next ten seems to be a common trend. Um, you know, it's 
tough to say, yeah, we're going to be here for 30 years. And then, you know, you never know what the market may not may do or may not do. And now you're stuck, you know, or you, you grew past your lease and, you know, you've got to pay for property that you can't get out of necessarily. So um, a big part of that should be assessed when you're doing your business plans and, and working with your teams to figure out, okay, I need this much in five years. I'm doing this. Do I do it now? Do I wait? Um, it, it's really a, a equation that needs to be balanced as you work through your, uh, your hoops here. All right, thank you. Uh, please, uh, for the members watching, please feel free to submit your questions on the Q&A and we'll, uh, we'll file those uh, and get them over to Brian. I have a question about uh, tap rooms. So, you know, Brian, when I first started getting into this six or seven years ago, pretty much everybody was installing new steel, you know, new tanks, new brew houses. Um, every facility seemed to have its own production center. And, and I really see, you know, average loans were pushing up against the SBA limit, you know, for, uh, of about $7 million. But now I'm, I'm seeing a lot of people focused on retail and doing more tap rooms and, and maybe even looking at smaller square footage and really trying to up the transactions per square foot. Can you comment a little bit on some trends you're seeing uh, in terms of how people are expanding now and, and what the spaces are looking like? Yeah. Um, again, we're, we're seeing the big variety of it as well. Um, a lot of people want to create sort of a, a central hub first, build up the brand there, and then start to basically reach out with these different arms of satellite tasting rooms. Um, and it's a, it works, but it's, you got to balance your business plan adequately though. Um, you know, think about uh, Oscar Blues out in Colorado and uh, Rock Bottom, kind of a little bit of everywhere nationwide. Um, they don't necessarily have a central location as much as they have destination areas dotted out throughout the area. Um, that's working well for them. But on the flip side, um, we've got a brewery actually here in Northeast Ohio. They're, they're listed as one of the top 100 in the world. And they have a tasting room that lets 80 people in. And that's mm. it. But they're in multiple states and multiple countries and they're knocking it out of the park. Um, you know, a couple of the key points to hit on is if you are going to start doing, say, these satellite tasting rooms to basically get yourself beyond your local footprint and maybe even into the regional reach, um, consider your, you know, how are you going to get your beer there? Is it going to cost you more to get into a truck and drive it there than it would be to add on additional space or an additional venue on top of your property and make people come to you? Um, it is a new logistic that you have to worry about. Now you're getting cooled, you know, vans or hopping in bed with a distributor, if you will, to try to get this stuff out there. Um, and of course, more space means more permits, which means, you know, you've got more employees. And so now you, you're not managing just this group, you're managing these groups. Um, but from the architectural side, yeah, absolutely. It's a great way to start introducing your brand to more areas and, you know, become a larger expansion. Yeah, I've, I've seen uh, in my trips to China, you know, it's back to permitting here a little bit that, you know, in China, it's actually pretty easy to get a restaurant permit and then add a brewery into that. It's actually very difficult to get a brewery permit. Um, you know, again, I, maybe just a couple anecdotal stories about sort of ease of permitting based on the business model that you're doing. You know, sometimes if you're in a mixed use facility, you know, making beer introduces weird smells and some, some people don't like that. Uh, I'm just curious, you know, in terms of getting permits through, is there a, a path of least resistance or is it just too different in, in everywhere you go? Uh, it, it will vary um, because you're looking at, you know, building department permits, zoning permits, and then you've also got your liquor agency, so state and federal permitting here in, in the U.S. anyway. Um, um, you know, certainly the uh, the tasting room model where you have the tasting room connected with the brewery has been pretty streamlined. Um, if you're serving food, that resolves a lot of the kind of questions that you end up with is, you know, do you need the restroom? Do you not need the restroom? That's, you know, here in Ohio, if you don't have a retail permit, you have to have at least one restroom, even if you're inside of a building with, you know, like a like a retail space that offers public restrooms down the corridor, you still have to have one in your suite. So that's a big surprise. Um, and 
you, you take it or leave it, honestly. Um, yeah, yeah, okay, thank you very much. Um, one of the things that, that you and I have talked about over the last couple of years is the fact that the, the wine industry has really reached a level of saturation, if you will, that, that beer seems to be trending towards, you know, and in wine, I think there's, gosh, about eight huge players and then about 10,000 other small players, most of them selling through retail. Um, if, you know, if beer is going to trend that way, I, I've, I've written blogs before where we talked about the fact that the, the largest 200 breweries uh, are, I believe, are going to start merging and acquiring with each other to try to keep their average margins high because they mostly sell through wholesale. And that's going to leave, you know, retail and selling direct to consumer as a great path for the majority of breweries in the United States and abroad. We've actually got a, a new member in the Netherlands that just signed up last week who's really focused on this retail model. And so I'm just curious, you know, wine almost offers a little bit of a crystal ball for the beer industry in some of these ways. You guys have worked with a lot of wineries. Do you have any, um, anything that we could learn as breweries from, from what you've seen on the design side of wineries? Yeah, and that's actually an interesting question given kind of the last two um, discussions we've had. So um, when we do wineries, uh, a lot of times they are they are one regional base. They're not they're not doing these satellite tasting rooms. They're not trying to create local you know tasting rooms or anything else. It's it's we have one spot. You come to us, and uh, the reason that's working for them is because it's not just a space where they make wine. There's um. We, it's what we call a destination place, and that's really the uh, the business plan in the market that they tend to trend to is that it's you come here and you get the romanticism of the, the acres of green vineyards, the smells, the aromas, the views, the patios. Um, it really makes people want to come and stay. And then what they've trended to now, and we're starting to see breweries do that as well is the introduction of hospitality spaces, so rental rooms, um, you know, which we talked about in a previous webinar, but also hotel rooms or uh, villas, if you will. So people come, and they're not just having one or two beers and moving on. They can, they can have a couple beers and then take a few back to their, you know, their room and you know, enjoy the rest of the night in comfort of their own kind of atmosphere. You know, they're not in the public anymore. Um, that's one of the big trends that I think that brewers are starting to catch on and do. I know uh, out west, I, mean, I can't think of a specific brewery name now, there's already a few that have done this. They built their brewery and then they bought some space next to them and now they've got a hotel there. Um, and yeah, it's, certain, certainly Stealth Brewing has pioneered that. Uh, they're, they're expanding hugely with a hotel facility in San Diego. Um, yeah. You know, I, I think, uh, you know, it, it hits on a lot of the boxes of the things that you and I talk about and that we talk about at Crafting a Strategy, which is, you know, the more you can control the drinking experience and the drinking occasion, the, the better experience your consumers can have. And so, you know, if they can have one or two uh, drinks in the pub and then take some back to their room, that's great. Um, you know, but, but also it's probably going to keep them coming back and it's going to increase the value, uh, not only to the consumer, but it's also probably going to increase the prices that, that we can charge because, it is the whole experience that we're selling, not just the technical features of the beer. Yep. And with, you know, again, I wouldn't say that the brewery market is saturated yet, although it is pretty full. Um, you know, you, we've seen more and more breweries and these, you know, restaurateur groups that are creating breweries, finding ways to make themselves stand out more. Um, I think of, uh, you know, Brew Dog down here in Ohio. They have a absolute massive property and uh you know it's one of the unique breweries when you go there you know what's up you've got kegs lining the parkway you've got a keg fountain in the middle of this pond they've got I mean, it's an experience when you go there um certainly more than you know walking down the street and just popping into a place but that's still not a bad experience either so i'm not saying you know abandon all your small retail windows and, and buy acres of property so well, and, and it's, you know, I, I think about BrewDog. I just went to their uh, location in Brussels. You know, they have an interesting business model. They seem to really target expensive real estate right in the heart of whatever city they're in. And they really do um, go after tourist, tourist dollars. Uh, you know, I, I, th I think about, uh, you know, travelers that have expense accounts and, and corporate accounts that are there to, you know, have a good time and spend money. I think that's pretty interesting, you know, locating yourself sort of in the pathway of people that are visiting a particular city. You know, back to wineries, though, you know, I think one of the 
one of the things about brew pubs uh, is, you know, the brewmaster might be there or the, the steel tanks are there and this sort of um, enchantment topic that we talk about on crafting a strategy of, you know, getting people close to the technologies and to the production equipment and to the people. You know, and I think wineries, there's such a, you know, a pastoral feel to a lot of these places. You know, you can go sit above the vineyards and often, you know, on a hill with the right slope and have these views. Uh, is there anything sort of, you know, one of the things you say in your bio at FMD Architects is, I'm going to get the quote wrong, but so you have to correct me, but, you know, basically uh, understanding the emotions that go into the space where people are living, working, consuming, you're going to have to get the quote right for me. But what, you know, what do wineries really do well that you think breweries could learn from in terms of the aesthetics? Um, they begin with that experience in mind. Um, you know, so it's, it's not, I just need to fill the space with my vessels and then people are going to come to me. It's all right. How do you, how do people approach this space? I mean, I, we recently wrote an article on this as well. The impressions that you set and the branding you set start as soon as you cross that threshold or, or make that turn off the road. So um, a few of the wineries that we've done and been involved with, it's, you know, an 80 acre plot and they've got, you know, a couple of different restaurants on there. They've got just views and views and every opportunity to find a little niche for you to find, you know, an area that you enjoy. Um, but they begin with that though. So, okay, we know we're going to plant venues here. So how can I get this view oriented to just absolutely frame this and uh, capture that? So when I'm sitting at the bar, you know, I don't have to put up artwork. The architecture and the site is the artwork. Um, that's something that they've always, you know, wineries in general have always exceeded and done well at, um, you know, taking part of that natural view and you know, running with it. Okay, and I did look up your quote to make sure that I uh, get it right. So let me, let me just lay it on here, Brian, because I love the quote. Uh, exploring how people interact with spaces and the buildings they occupy. Um, what I just heard you say is it's not just the building, it's the driveway that leads up to the winery. You know, maybe, um, you know, can you give an example? You know, I know you're working on a couple breweries right now that have a little bit of extra space. Uh, before I get to a, a question from the audience, can you talk a little bit about maybe how you've tied in that experience of walking through the door or driving up for the driveway and some of your breweries that have a little bit more space? Sure. So it, it's really uh, diving into the emotional connection uh, and that everybody has. And, um, you know, obviously everybody purchases emotionally and many a time. And so, you know, as, as you know, you, in one case here in Ohio, we've got a winery where you, you have this really big arched gate that has the name on it, wood panels, and you don't just drive in and see the building park and walk in. You take this kind of meandered curving path and it's lit by trees wrapped in lights. And almost as soon as you turn off that road in the middle of a pretty standard city, you're, you're transported somewhere else almost. And again, kind of keying into that romanticism of a winery. But, um, you know, sometimes that extra, you know, few feet of asphalt to make that turn you know, go around instead of just a, a linear shot it makes a huge difference to just getting people out of their workday and, and ready to just enjoy what you sell, what you do, what you've created. Um, that's kind of the, the big thing that they, you know, again, and in, in thinking of one particular winery is doing well. Um, and even on the brewery side, uh, a brewery out in Texas, the one I mentioned earlier as well, mm -hmm. They've got a, a large outdoor patio that's elevated up above another, it's kind of a tier of patios. Well, we needed structure for the roof above, so we actually oriented that with the two columns, the roof and the floor, create a frame that overlooks this uh, bike park, and it's a pretty desert, you know, arid area, but there's a pond here, and it's like one of the only ponds in the area, so that's a huge area where people are going to say, yeah, yeah, we want to run out that spot. Um, we want to reserve that spot and get people excited and wanting to come back and again kind of what you can learn from the wine side okay i got my first question here this is from a brewery and planning in in europe so just kind of at a very basic level can you talk about um sort of the electrical necessity and water water needs for for a you know a standalone tasting room maybe a 15 barrel system or a 10 barrel system what are the the basics that a building needs to have in order for you to you know really see a brewery fitting in there in terms of the utility hookups 
Uh, big things before you ever, if you're looking at an existing space, some of the big things you want to look for, obviously, is uh, adequate power. So uh, most brew house equipment requires three-phase power. I don't think I've run across single phase yet. Um, and that's an expensive upgrade if it's not already there, because uh, you're bringing in transformers, you got to step it up, down, et cetera. Um, that's a big, big bonus if you've already got that involved with the space on the electric side. Um, on the water side, you know, obviously you want to have adequate pressure. Um, you know, it's going to vary so much by brew size, but kind of a rule of thumb is if you've got at least an inch and a half or two inches of uh, water in, you're going to start off okay. Um, obviously, there's a lot of other factors, you know, the number of toilet sinks, are you cooking the kitchen that it will affect that load? But for just production side, that's usually um, satisfactory. Um, what about, yeah, a great, great answer. Another thing that I run into constantly, and, and again, this varies almost city to city, it's the parking requirements. You know, often the number of parking spaces that you have adjacent or within a certain distance from where the beer is going to be consumed, that affects your occupancy, you know, how many people you can have in there. Um, is, that, is that pretty typical that you need to also consider uh, what parking is going to be like when you're, when you're looking at a potential space? Absolutely. Um, that's actually a tough one to explain sometimes when you say, well, I, I, I have space for 300 people in this building. What do you mean I can't? And it's like, well, a lot only allows 200 or 100, whatever it may be. Um, you know, that it requires a lot of space. And uh, again, zoning dictates that. So in, in many cities, if you're in a downtown district, they don't they don't have any parking requirements you know it's we've got lots we've got garages people will park there um, if you're creating your own space or, or going into a building that has an existing lot it is a controlling factor that it'll affect how many people you can have in there um, and of course then you get into paving and get into okay now i need you know how is the water and the storm water being treated and protected you know it, it gets complicated if it's not addressed up front very good. I got another question here from a, a brewery and planning uh, in the Portland, Oregon area. So we're talking about um, loading and unloading and basically dock space. You know, I've, I've toured a couple facilities where the, the loading dock was pretty narrow. I, I wasn't sure that a fully loaded uh, forklift with a fully loaded pallet could actually make a complete turn. Um, what, are, what are some of the, you know, most people, even if they're starting solely selling over the counter, most of them have ambitions for self-distribution or have ambitions to sort of send beer out the back to a distributor. What about, you know, sort of the, the loading dock and, and warehousing and, and, and that sort of thing to get the beer in and out in your self-distribution or wholesale? Any, any sort of minimum requirements that you look for in a building? Uh, there, there are some, and I'll answer that as well. You were jogging my memory on something as well. Um, you know, going back to the permitting question that we started with, um, some zoning districts won't allow you to distribute out of your space. So that's a big thing to be aware of as well. So if you're, you're ready to invest in a property and put in a dock and they won't let you run business out of there without a zoning variance or, you know, going in front of the board and changing the zoning, um, that is a big restriction. So um, to the requirements for the dock, it, it really depends on what you're comfortable with and what you have in your budget. So um, many of the facilities we have don't have docks and that's just because of uh, budget restraints or site restraints. And so they're paying, you know, what you know, varies, but I'll say it's $150 extra surcharge for the lift gate on the truck. If they're fine with that, you know, they don't need the dock. Um, but if you're going to do large wholesale distribution, um, that's when you look into, okay, do I need to recess? And, you know, because if you're on grade, you have to recess down in order to get a dock, or are you going to build up so that that truck can back up? And if you're going to build up, Okay, well, do you know what truck you're using? Are you going to use a refrigerated truck? Is it a semi-trailer? All of that affects the height. And they've got products like uh, dock levelers that will come up and down a little bit to help, you know, ease that difference. Um, but again, another cost to consider as well when you go into the docks. Um, certainly from our experience, uh, and this isn't something controlled by code, but our best practice for us has been no kind of the maximum that you're going to have on there. So if you're running a, a forklift on there, find out if that's got minimum requirements, or if you're going to have pallets stored on there, make sure that you have enough room 
behind the pallet for whatever you're going to be moving the pallet. So is it a pallet jack? Are you just walking behind it and, uh, you know, pushing this thing somehow, or are you going to yeah, use a forklift? Yeah. You know, sometimes things just get dumped off the truck as quick as possible. The truck's gone and you're going, well, well crud, I needed that one way behind all this. Now I've got to move all this just to get to that and then move it all back as it goes into a certain order. There's a, you know, especially with like uh, raw goods like grains or grapes, you have to use a certain amount within a certain time and kind of respecting that order when you're storing things is important to remember as well. That's great. We're getting a little bit short on time here. I have one last question because I see it happen a lot um, and that's the, the cold storage and planning for it. You know, uh, we had one member, Ben Engler at Occidental Brewing, when he first got started, his cold storage had a man door basically and he would have to basically tear pallets apart move the beer in and then restack them. And it was really uh, a, an expensive labor cost. Another um, one of our members after one year in at uh, postdoc brewing in Redmond, Washington, uh, Tom Schmidlin talked about how, you know, he's, he's running a tasting room and he's got the cold storage and he has everything, you know, stacked to the gills in there. And invariably, you know, the keg that he blows is stored the furthest away from the door and behind the most other things just about mm -hmm. every time, uh, you know, so, you know, with cold storage, you know, the easy answer, I guess, is, well, plan to have plan to put in more than you think you'll need but uh it's just a problem that i see a lot of people do some of them outsource cold storage to you know cold warehouses do you have any and we didn't pre-plan this question so i'm putting you on the spot a little bit here but uh with, with regard to cold storage and you know how much of your warehouse space should be dedicated to that or or just some rules of thumb to kind of wrap up the webinar here um Again, if you're already distributing, the question is much easier to answer. You kind of know how much you need to store at one point and plan for that when you're expanding. Um, for a lot of the startups we do, that's it's a big unknown variable. And um, I wouldn't say it's a shot in the dark because there's certainly an educated guess to it. But, you know, it's okay. You know, you're producing this much beer a year. You want to distribute it at this much quality. So you can kind of run the numbers. You're making runs a month or you're making runs every week. Um, if you're making runs every week, yeah, that, you know, you can get much smaller, but if you're storing it up and making one big distribution run, especially if you're self distributing or you have a distributor that's only stopping by, you have to understand what their, their kind of rates and requirements are. Um, and then basically just, okay, a pallet's, 48 by 48 and it's got a six inch overhang for grain or kegs, whatever it may be. All right, so if I know I need, you know, if I'm filling a truck with eight pallets, uh, you know, a month, I need that much space plus circulation, plus, you know, you, you may end up having beers that just go through the process a lot quicker than you'd expect and you can't just have them sitting there. So you always have, you know, I, I usually like to try to do two or three, you know, I call it really four because you can stack them a little bit of extra reserve space for whatever it may be even special releases where you're you're brewing them in advance and you know you're not serving them right away you got to store them somewhere uh, ideally cold so they're not going to spoil yeah especially for the non-pasteurized beers that most of us make you know the that that reminds me of, of one other thing uh, and that is you know can storage you know a lot of folks use mobile canners to save money but you, the cans have to sit somewhere while you're waiting for that mobile canner to show up and it needs yeah. to be dry and it needs to be, you know, protected. So there's so many things that go into your square footage needs that a, a lot of breweries don't anticipate. And that's why I love these webinars because, you know, you and I get to go back and forth. We get to take questions and, you know, try to help people see around corners. And if, if they yeah. have a specific question, uh, I can tell you, you know, working with Brian the last couple of years, give him a call, send him an email. He'll, he'll do, do right by you just to make you think about things that maybe you didn't know to look for. Uh, last thing before I wrap up here for all of our listeners, <clears throat> don't forget that this webinar and all the other webinars, uh, the previous two are on the business model page of the craftingastrategy.com website. It's very interesting, you know, after, uh, usually right before a, a webinar and right after, folks will go back and, and, listen, and listen and watch the previous webinars, so I highly encourage you to do that. Um, and I'm sure we're going to get a lot of traffic on this one too once, once we start promoting it. So Brian, thanks again for making the time for us. It looks like you're in Ohio right now at the, at the headquarters. Yeah, at the headquarters. And I, I did have one closing comment as well, because you jogged my memory, if I may. Perfect. Um, so thinking about the cans as well, and, and going back to the doc discussion, um, 
Cans come in preset heights and they're all packaged up. So make sure your door is at least tall enough to accept that. Um, a lot of times you're looking at nine, 10, 12 feet of cans in one, you know, delivery. And, you know, uh, many times I see an eight foot door. It's not fitting unless you're tipping it. And that's obviously a risk of denting your cans pre, you know, and these are empty cans, you know, not the, not the ones you're running out the door. So it's kind of a, a last thing there as far as that goes. Well, and, and it's, it's just so important to try to anticipate these things beforehand because you are going to sign a five-year lease and, you know, you, you do your best to plan the tenant improvements, but you always get surprised. There's always, you know, some re-engineering or value engineering that happens. And so, Brian, thanks again for joining us to help us try to anticipate some of these issues and, and help us expand our breweries. Absolutely. Happy to help. All right. Thanks, everybody, for attending. And uh, we'll be messaging you soon to talk about our next webinar in this six webinar series with Brian Grafton and his colleagues at FMD Architects. Thanks everybody. Good night.